Hello and welcome to Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake. And I'm Russ. And today we are coming back to Philip Morley's cabinet. Philip Morley's wall hanging record cabinet. You can put your turntable up here. You can put your amplifier up here. And um, in the last show that we did on this, we covered advanced mortise and tenon joinery. We've got some really cool mortise and tenon joints in this cabinet. But today we're moving beyond that. And we're helping you cut these really cool coopered doors for this cabinet. Coopered curved doors. Yes, 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 yes. Coopered curved doors. A lot going on. I think coopered implies curved. I thought the cooper was this part. Mm, I would call that fluted. I fluted think the, coopered. <laughs> fluted coopered doors. There it is. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that. Okay, so to do that, we built this fixture. Um, this fixture we use for the glue up. We also use it to install these hinges because these hinges are on a crazy... 82 degree angle on one side so you'd have a really hard time fixturing that otherwise and in today's show we're going to walk you through how to build this fixture and then also how to use it to glue up these parts how to glue up these doors and how to cut these hinge mortises yeah uh later on in the show we're going to mount this whole thing up in workstation so it gives us a nice clean surface to clamp our curved door to and accurately cut those hinges yeah let's look at what we're going from and what we're going to so we're going to start with these crazy fluted staves like this, that's going to get glued up into this kind of plain door panel. So this is what we're going to cut those hinge mortises into. And then at the end of the show, there's a couple extra features on this that we'll talk about that have already been added to this. And we're going to go ahead and install this in the cabinet. Great. So regular stuff before we start every show, right? We've uh, got, yes. you know, <laughs> the, was... the giveaway, which is the big one. The Q&A, which is a big one. Yep. Um, and make sure that you ask your questions in the chat. We've got Ted, as always, in the chat today, and he's going to be asking or answering. He might be asking some questions, too. You better watch out. It's true. Stay on your A-game. Um, he's going to be answering questions in the chat, and he's going to be sending questions to us to answer live at the end. And to enter that giveaway at the end of the show, you're going to need to answer our poll question, which today is, what do you do or what do you want to do to make money with Origin. Yeah, how do you make money with Origin? Because we know that a lot of people do, mm -hmm. and we're just curious to hear about your experiences there. Yeah. Is it signs? Is it personalization, cutting boards? Is it a tool to make furniture? Really curious to hear what you guys are using it for to make some money. Yeah, cool. mull that over. And without further ado. Yeah, I think we should move all this stuff off to the side. Um, we have one side of this fixture uh, partially cut already let's go ahead to the overhead cam here we've got one side of this fixture partially cut already you you will notice that this is a little slimmer than the fixture that we're using in the show that's because we've updated all of these files to be a little bit easier to manage in your shop a little lighter to move around a little easier to clamp to workstation um but yeah where are you at on this right now jake i am cutting through three quarter birch plywood with the standard uh quarter inch bit that comes with origin and i am just about done with my auto pass cut uh, so I just have the finished pass cut left on this, and then I'm going to move on to my next one, which is just above it. Yeah, cool. So while people are still kind of filtering into the show, we're going to finish the cut here with that finishing pass. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move this off the stage also. And then when we're done with that finishing pass, we'll come back. We'll tell you guys all about how we scanned and gridded this, got it all set up, and we'll reset this part for the second fixture operation. What do you think about that? Let's do it. Okay, cool. Nice thing about AutoPass is I left off right here. You can see where that white dot is. So it's going to let me go right back into my finished pass instead of having to do all four passes again. So here we go. Run in speed five. Shaper Sessions is our bi-weekly live demo where we try to teach you something about how to use Shaper Origin in your shop. Um, again, today we're you know covering a pretty advanced topic, these Cooper doors, uh, using this fixture both for glue up and for installing some really interestingly uh, arranged hardware on that 82 degree corner. Um, but the basics definitely still apply. So this is the same kind of flat plywood sheet cut that we've done quite often on this show. Um, and we are gonna go back and we're gonna show you guys how to set this all up, 
Um, Jake already has the tape laid out. Uh, if you want to learn more about tape layout specifically, um, I would recommend you go back and watch our session on Origin Pro Tips. But once the tape's laid out, the next couple of steps here are to scan that tape in with the camera on Origin, to grid, and to place your design. And we're going to walk you guys through all of that. All right. This is free and cut to its final shape with a finish pass. You can tell I was being really nice and steady on that finish pass because I want a good, clean surface. Um, but for our next, next cut during our roughing cuts, I'm going to go kind of quick. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and start fresh with a scan. I like to start at the top, top left, just nice and steady. Move side to side and work your way down, overlapping each of those passes. And when you're done with the scan, Jake, I actually have a couple of questions on your setup here because I yeah. like what you did to set up this plywood. There we go. And hit finish. What's that? Yeah, I mean, just looking at this, I like how you've got the clamps in the MFT to hold your spoil board down. I like how you've got the plywood on the spoil board so that we're not cutting into our work surface. And um, I'm assuming you've got double-sided tape I under do. there. I got uh, two strips underneath where I know my parts are going to fall, so they're mm -hmm. nice and secure. And then I have uh, two diagonal strips up at the top just so that the tape doesn't move relative to the parts that I'm cutting once I cut through. Mm -hmm. Cool. Next... After the scan, it automatically moves us down to design. Find that import button. And we have all our files for the cabinet, but we're looking for fixture parts B. Let's see with those curves. Now, I am going to rotate this 180. And before I continue, I actually created a grid on the first time because I, was, I have a straight cut on the back and I wanted to utilize the straight cut of the plywood. So I placed this file directly on that. So I'm going to take a step back and do that. Mm -hmm. So that's grid. Come hang over the edge and lower the bit down just so that it's below the surface of the material. Contact one, contact two, and come around to one of the edges of your material for the third probe. Nice. And I'm sorry, Jake, I was a little distracted. Did you talk about the difference between doing this with the, uh, the router bit versus the probe, the engraving bit? No, I have not. Mm. Okay. Because you just did that with the actual cutter. Here, I did. Right. And because this is a flat sheet apply and we're cutting these parts out completely, you can be a little bit looser with it. But if you're doing something more particular, like fine joinery, like a mortise and tenon, you mm -hmm. wanted it to be perfectly, perfectly aligned, we would recommend you use the engraving bit upside down in the spindle as a probe. Um, and again, if you want to learn more about this, check out that Origin Pro Tips session, I would say. Yeah. All righty. Now we can go back into import, grab that fixture parts B, rotate 180. And you're rotating 180 to keep that flat edge closer to the edge of Precisely. the part. Just, just to save you a little bit of effort there, yeah. Yeah, I didn't actually have to cut this straight away, but I will on this next one. Let me go ahead and place it. What's nice, too, is I'm confident that's exactly where I placed the other one. Mm-hmm because of that grid. So often, even if you don't need a grid, it will behoove you to make one, uh, just in case you need to edit the file for whatever reason in the middle of the cut and need to replace it. Where did behoove come from? It's a good word. It doesn't get want, used enough. I don't want to be hooved, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> All right. Now, we're dropping into cut. Let's run through our auto pass setups. I got three quarters of an inch depth cutting to a zero offset, so true to size, quarter inch bit, everything's Z-touched already, but it never hurts to do it again. There we go. And I want to open up our auto pass. This is a pretty standard looking auto pass setup for a piece of three quarter ply. Quarter, half inch, three quarter, all of which with a roughing offset, and come back in with that finished pass. Okay, great. You want to just cut that out? I'm going to get cruising. Cool.
So as Jake's cutting this out, um, some kind of standard stuff, but it never hurts to go over it again. Origin is our handheld CNC router for uh, woodworking and more. And as he's moving this router around, you can see that dot is sticking exactly to that dotted line. Um, it is a CNC machine, so there is a toolpath, but the toolpath, the tool automatically calculates for you. There's no programming or anything. Just put in those settings at the left side of the screen, and it will calculate this dotted line for you. And all you need to do is follow the dotted line. Now, that dot is sticking to the dotted line. The dot represents the center of Jake's spindle. And as he's moving around, um, Origin is going to be auto-correcting for Jake in real time to keep that spindle exactly on the toolpath, right where it's supposed to be, right on that dotted line. Um, it's going to do that all the way up to the boundary of that circle. Um, if Jake gets the dot outside the boundary of the circle, um, for any reason, it may be because he hit a knot in the wood or because, you know, he was maybe just not paying attention or you know, a variety of reasons, um, Origin will automatically retract so that you don't accidentally cut into your work farther than you mean to. And um, that's the huge difference between Origin and kind of your standard plunge router, where if you're plunge routing this, even if you've got a template, if you mess up, uh, you could not only cut through your part in a way that you don't mean to, but you also are cutting through and destroying your template in a way that's pretty unpleasant. Um, so that's a pretty good thing with this. Now, AutoPass is an extension for Origin. We're using it today because it makes cutting out big pieces like this from a sheet of ply uh, much easier. Really, any cut that has multiple steps, either in depth or in offset. So today we're doing three depth passes to get to that three-quarter inch depth. And we're doing one roughing pass and one finishing pass. So we're doing two different offsets for this, that offset being uh, the amount of extra clearance that we're giving the router bit away from the final dimension of that template um, as we're going around the cut here. So we're on pass 3 of 4, and we'll see as Jake comes around to pass 4 of 4, he's going to stay at the same depth, but Origin is going to move him slowly right into that final template dimension. See it moving right into that new dotted line? And now he's taking off just that last... I think with a quarter inch router bit, it falls to 0 0.025 inches, which is about half a millimeter, uh, a little more than half a millimeter. He's taken off just that last half a millimeter of material here all the way around that template. And what that does is it gives you the smoothest result possible. And when we're making a fixture for something like Cooper doors, um, we want that fixture or that template to be as precise as possible. So I definitely recommend using a finishing pass for that especially for this curve right here. We want to follow this curve nice and uh, smoothly, and that's going to give you the best results with your finish work. The, you know, the fixture influences the finish work pretty directly. Um, as Jake comes around here, he's going to reach the end, and AutoPass will automatically say, hey, okay, you're done. Um, time to retract. Uh, if Jake were to make a mistake at any point with AutoPass, the cool thing about it is that you don't have to start from the start again. You just pick right back up where you left off with that white dot that we used um, at the top of the show. So Jake had already done those three roughing passes. When he paused and came back to do that finishing pass, there was that white dot that lets you pick right back up where you left off. All right. There you go. Not bad. How'd it feel? It felt great. Um, and I don't know if you saw the overhead while I was cutting, but on those roughing passes, I was kind of cooking. Yeah, I'm looking at the clock. We're way ahead of schedule. Yeah. All right, sure. Good luck. No. <laughs> um, and that's because I know I have that roughing offset. So if mm -hmm. I were to fall out of bounds, I'm confident that I'm not going to have a huge gouge in my finished part. Mm -hmm. um, and two, it's it's plywood. It's pretty consistent throughout, so I'm not worried about hitting any weird void, relatively voidless plywood. Um, mm -hmm. But biggest tips on cutting fast like that are work your way up to it and then really focus on your body mechanics and on those long sweeping curves Instead of just driving with your arms, 
really drive with your whole body. Lock your elbows in. Sports stance. Sports stance, exactly. <laughs> I've done sports since high school, but this must be why I'm so athletic because all this origin time. And of course, I'm using our razor sharp mm, mm -hmm. pry bar. Yeah, careful with that thing. Seriously. It is handy to have that nice, strong, you know, you can really pry with that thing. I just love it. <laughs> you can <laughs> both you can both get under there and you can pry with it. Yep. All right. And there we go. Two perfectly identical curved staves. Yeah, nice. So let's look at those again in context with that fixture. We've got a little bit of space over here just to show again what parts these are. Now, this fixture, again, there's a couple of differences. Um, the one that we're building now is a little bit shallower than this, but we can hold one of these up against these and see the, the similarity of that curve there. Yeah, love that. Um, nice. And this will all make more sense with how this works for the glue up. After the break, we're going to come back and show you guys how to glue all this stuff up. One other quick note to mention on that fixture is, I mean, the files here include two, but um, there are three dividers in this one let's go to the front cam yeah there we go there are three in this one um three i cut an extra one for it but you don't really need that i think yeah. it's pretty well supported just with two i would make this again just to save a little bit of time there you go so choose your own adventure though you can make a third one great um we are running fast but it's time for that mid-show break <laughs> let's do it um remember that poll question the poll question is um, how do you make money with Origin? Or if you don't have Origin yet, how do you plan to make money with it? We're really curious to see what you do, whether it's sign making or you know um, professional architectural stuff. Like Ramon's probably on here. Ramon's gonna say, "Oh, I just made these cool, you know, fully inlaid barn doors or something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, flexing on us." But whatever it is, whether it's customizing cutting boards or you know, we were just talking about the other day, like. Uh, photo arches for like weddings oh absolutely you know stuff like that or even you know the whole wedding department is uh <laughs> yeah chock full of sign custom wooden signage yeah 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 so anyway that's the poll question goose or ian can you let me know if that's up we got ian actually on the switchboard today okay we're rolling on the poll question now a couple more things that i want to mention and we're gonna i think we're gonna build in excitement with these great so the first one is the thing that we've talked about the most over the last couple of weeks. It's this cabinet project, yes. um, Phil's cabinet. Now, I do want to show you guys this on Shaper Hub one more time. So let's pop over to the laptop here. If you go to Shaper Hub, um, we've got a search button right over here. Just type in wall hanging record cabinet, and that's going to bring you um, through a search page to here. This is Phil Morley's wall hanging record cabinet. And if you are curious at all about this project, uh, if you think you want to build it, or if you just want to see some really beautiful shop drawings and maybe learn some techniques that you can apply whether or not you, whether or not you own or use Origin, check out this project. Um, these are all the files that are included. We've got all of the Origin files here. You can see we're cutting fixture parts B here today, and we're going to cut hinge mortises for the door shortly. But the really cool thing here is the shop drawings for the wall hanging record cabinet. And um, I would really encourage you to just go check this out and download it. There's a lot of really cool information about different router bits that you can use for this project, both for the fluting and for the kind of thumbnail profiles. So let me pull up this photo. Router bits for the fluting and the thumbnail profiles, those are all in these shop drawings. And then dimensions, which are frankly useful even if you want to build this without origin. You could totally go ahead and do that. So. Definitely check out The Wall Hanging Record Cabinet by Phil Morley on Shape Hub. Speaking of cool things um, that you might learn something from, we mentioned this on the last show. We've got a new woodworking masterclass that's out, and we've got a whole bunch of these. Matt Kenny, Daryl Peart, Martin Winterhager. Okay, the new one here is from COC Design, and they're thinking about design thinking, material selection, and finishing when it comes mostly to furniture, furniture, kind of sculptural furniture and woodworking. Um, so you can see the scale of some of these beautiful things that they make. Look at these huge mortise legs. You can see the mortise that's cut there. 
Um, we played the teaser for this last week, so we're not going to play it again. But I would really encourage you to check this out at shapertools.com slash masterclass. And I'm going to mention one more masterclass that's basically required watching for this show that we're doing today. Um, that's the one with Caleb James here, chairmaker from South Carolina. Now, he's a chairmaker and a toolmaker. He makes his own spoke shaves. Um, and the thing that we're going to mention uh, a little bit later in the show is how we use a curved card scraper to clean up the fluted staves or the fluted doors on this build. And Caleb has just an absolutely phenomenal section on how to sharpen and use your card scrapers. And it absolutely changed the way that I use them here. Yeah. They are absolutely an essential piece Especially when doing tough stuff like this. There's just no way you could sand that much. I couldn't sand that. And if I sanded it, I would take the peaks off of the flutes, exactly. too. Um, and you'll see, guys, I mean, like, this is what I was working with with the card scraping. I burned this a little bit. It went from this, okay, to this in, like, how long did I spend on this? Like, five minutes? Maybe. Something like that? Yeah. And only because I was shooting a video at the same time. So, <laughs> check that out. Check out Caleb James' masterclass on shapertools.com slash masterclass. Learn all about card scrapers. It's going to change your life. Okay. One, two, three. Third thing. Okay. So, you guys know this we do. This is super cool. <laughs> this is super cool. This is Jake's favorite thing. Yeah. Um, you guys know that we do giveaways every show. Usually, we give away shaper stuff. Um, since we're about to finish this cabinet and we were out of Rubio Monaco. Uh, hit up our friends there to ask them to send us some. And we had a fun idea, which is that they're going to send us a couple extra cans of Rubio. Um, oil plus 2C, pure, just the like, the the regular, the awesome, natural, regular stuff, basic yeah. stuff. Uh, it's my favorite that they make. And they're going to send those to us to use as giveaways for the next couple of shows. On top of that, they're going to send us a discount code that live viewers of sessions are going to have access to for a limited time frame, um, yeah. just so that it doesn't run away from them. But uh, Rubio Monaco giveaways plus discount code on our next show two weeks from now. And I wanted to announce that because I think it's awesome. So, yes. And we want you to be there for it. Last but not least, best for last, I think. A new product is always best for last. New product. Uh, you ever been walking around with your trace over your arm or around your neck or something, and you're like, gosh, I wish I had a place to put this. All the time. All the time. Now we do. It is the trace case, and it is perfect for a A5 sketchbook and... Maybe we go to the overhead cam There on it is. Yeah, nice. Perfect for an A5 sketchbook and your trace, and, of course, a handy spot to hold your artist pen that comes with trace. Let me pull up the uh, website because I think it's an A4 sketch pad. A4. It's just so hard to keep track. What I say? Let A5. What even are letters? <laughs> Let's go to the computer. A4. Let's go to the computer here for the details. Okay, so um, you'll find this on shapertools.com under the Origin Essentials tab in our um, accessories. Accessories, Origin Essentials. That's going to take you to Trace Case. Um, it is $39 for the Trace Case on its own. It fits Trace and an A4 sketch pad. Um, made of some really nice material. It's got this really cool little loop on the side for your trace pen. Uh, the trace pen is not included with the case, but you get that with trace itself. And if you want to bundle trace plus the case, uh, you'll save $8, which is something. Hey. So uh, shaper trace plus case, uh, 130 bucks, And then you get the trace, the case, and the pen. And um, yeah, we will do some tracing. I think we'll do some tracing on the next show. We kind of ran out of time Sounds good. for this one. It's been a full day. <laughs> That's been... uh, we did a live stream for the whole company earlier this morning, which was a ton yep. of fun. But uh, we're going to save the Trace demo for the next show. If you're interested in more Trace, did you know, this is fun, actually, because we were looking up stats earlier today, that the show that we did on Trace, the Trace launch show, is the most popular session that we have ever done. That's amazing. Yeah. We got to do more tracing. So check that out. That's on the ShaperTools, uh, shapertools.com slash sessions. If you just scroll down a little bit, there's going to be welcome to trace. And as always, if you have something that you want to see traced, send us an email at sessions at shapertools.com. Yes, please. Speaking of sending us things to sessions at shapertools.com, I'm a little bit behind on getting back to people about their shop tours. We've got a couple that are in the inbox that I need to reply to. So if that's you, 
That's my fault. I'm sorry. But please keep sending us shop tours to sessions at shapertools.com. And I promise I will get back to you uh, with something nice. And uh, today's shop tour is from Steve. Uh, Steve sent us a shop tour. If you want to send us a shop tour, we ask for something that's like three to four minutes long. Landscape orientation narrated, ideally, so that we don't have to talk over it. It's nice to have a little break. And uh, without further ado, let's roll a shop tour from Steve. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my shop. I've been here about seven years, and before I say anything else, I'm uh, not necessarily a, a neat guy. In fact, I pretty much rely on gravity to hold everything in place for me. Um, yeah, I've been here about seven years. This is my old hobby. I used to uh, fly high-powered model rockets back in the day. Uh, but nowadays, I pretty much spend my days in here making uh, stuff from wood. Uh, this is my, uh, I store all my plans there. I have old planes, a few model rockets, things I made on the lathe, uh, a lot of epoxy junk right now. Uh, most everything in here, uh, fixture-wise, I made. I made this bench. I made that bench, the cabinets, the chop saw station, all that, wood storage. Uh, I made this router table, <coughs> use it a lot. Um, I bought this at a garage sale for 300 bucks. <laughs> My drum center, $300, awesome deal. <laughs> Couldn't got better. Uh, storage and uh, entertainment, yeah. Um, shop heat. Mortiser, my lathe, um, that steady rest there I made on my, made with my Shaper Origin, my 17 inch bandsaw and dust collection. Uh, back here we have uh, a spare table saw, my real table saw, um, oh, wood storage. I, I, I'm kind of a wood hoarder. Can never have enough wood. Drill press, sanders of various types, more more wood, joiner, um, more wood, fixtures, jigs, yada yada yada. Um, my cabinet saw, love my cabinet saw. Um, yeah, clamps, plate. Other stuff, shaper. Uh, really like my shaper. I, I use it a lot when I can. Um, and in fact, it's set up. I just made a uh, charcuterie board, uh, designed it on Studio. It's over here, has some epoxy on it. I'm starting to do uh, some epoxy art on it. It's going to be a Christmas present. Um, anyway, this is pretty much all of it, but uh, I. Uh, I spend most of my time out here. I'm retired. I make a lot of sawdust. It's a working shop, as you can see. Anyway, thanks for looking it over. Have a great day. Bye now. I love that so much. I feel <laughs> so great. personally vindicated. Yeah? Yeah, because you were cleaning up after me this afternoon. Does gravity also hold ever? <laughs> yes. I really appreciate my, that. I like to say, you know, I've, you, um, they say... A uh, cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind, right? But mm. what about, what would they say about an empty desk, Jake, or an empty shop? Touche. Rather have it be full. I agree. If it's not out in front of me, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I love so. that. And I love the origin made study rest. I love just having projects out. Such yeah. a good energy. It's a really great application, too. Something that needs to be perfectly symmetrical all yeah. the way around. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And you're a lathe guy, so. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Rockets. That was cool. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see a lathe turned rocket. There you go. That would be sweet. Cool. Thank you so much for sending that over, Steve. Yeah. Uh, we'll send you something nice. Yeah. So, okay. So we can get back to this fixture now. Um, we've cut the sides. The rest of this stuff is um, pretty much table saw work, except for, I'll mention, the top. We did not cut this on the show, but this is kind of the same process, a flat cut and ply. 
we pre-cut these little scoops in there because you need to be able to access the hinge mortises through this fixture, and that will all make a lot more sense in about 10 minutes. But before we do that, um, I want to show you guys how we use this fixture actually for this glue up. Now, I've got this door, which already has been glued, but I also have a bunch of these loose staves. And so we're going to go ahead and put this together. Let's do it. Okay, so almost every single one of these is angled on both sides. Um, the standard angle for, you know, what is it, like 12 of the 14 angles between, or it's 16, because there's eight staves. Mm -hmm. There's eight staves, so there's 16 angles, right? Uh, so 14 of the 16 angles are, I'm getting there, 90.6 degrees. Right. Okay. Which sounds Which crazy, what, but it that's all what comes makes together. this arc. It, so almost all of these are at 90.6 degrees. There's two exceptions. Um, the far right side of the cabinet is a flat 90 degrees because that's the 90 degree corner mm -hmm. of the cabinet. The opposite side of the door is, I think, 82 degrees. And because that's the... Um, yeah, that's the farthest in on the curve of the cabinet, and that transitions to the other flat side of the cabinet, so it's a sharper angle. So this fixture, the far end where those hinge mortise cutouts are, ends at 82 degrees. And so we're going to put this door with the 82 degree side in over there. See how that fits together pretty well? Okay, now I've got a bunch more of these 90.6 degree staves. And you'll notice the difference. I think we could do this on the overhead cam. You'll notice the difference between the width on these. Um, that's because I made the staves oversized and then trimmed the door down on the crosscut sled uh, after the fact. Now, this one is special. Um, this stave has one 90 degree side and one 90.6 degree side. So I marked that when I cut it on the table saw. And you want that 90 degree side to be on the outside of the door. Okay. Now, there's kind of two different things going on in the glue up here. We've got these wedges, which I'm going to hand to Jake kind of offset so he can get them in that gap, which um, those wedges, when you press them together, provide the clamping action from the left to the right. One slightly tricky thing about that is that if your angles aren't absolutely perfect, your door is going to tend to lift. So what I do for every single one of these staves is I put a clamp from the top of the stave down to the bottom of the fixture and we could just kind of indicate that on um yeah there you go perfect we could indicate that right there <laughs> um, in this area. so i do that uh phil what phil does actually is he has a um a band like a strap that goes all the way around the thing with some foam over the top to protect the peaks of those flutes uh that's another way to approach it you could put a strap all the way around it that is why the ends of the fixture are a little bit below the uh, the peaks of the flutes, mm -hmm. so that that strap actually applies pressure all the way around. Yeah, so I like that. There's the reasoning there. Um, put some glue in here. Make sure that you don't put glue between the fourth and the fifth stave here, uh, because that's where your door is going to open. So you can glue this all up at once. Just don't put glue between the two halves of the door. Might help to put. It. Did you do blue tape? Uh, I didn't. You could. That's another thing, actually, that I wanted to talk about. I waxed the fixture. Ah, nice. And that worked pretty well. You could also do blue tape or packing tape on the fixture to make sure this stuff comes up because it is wood on wood and you are going to have some glue squeeze out underneath. And it would also suck to have your doors stuck to your fixture when you were done because you'd have to make, oh man, you'd have to make all new doors. You'd have to make an all new fixture. <laughs> I would be pretty upset with myself. <laughs> That's the kind of mistake you only make once. You only make once. Yeah. Um, or let's say every five years. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to make that mistake again. <laughs> I'll be happy if it takes a couple of years to get there. This is such a cool glue-up fixture. It really is. And honestly, it's not that, especially with all the files that are provided, it's not that involved to create. It's not that involved to create. Um, and in those files, in the shop drawings, there's an exploded view of this so that you can know exactly how it goes together and all that stuff. Sweet. So... I think the next step is we're going to use this. We already use this to glue up the one door. We're going to use this in workstation to um, mortise the top, the hinges in that 82 degree side, which you would basically have no way of holding without a fixture like this because that angle is just so strange. Are we putting it in workstation as is? 
Um, what I did, just for simplicity's sake, when I did this last time, is I took out all the extra stuff, just put the door in there, and I used a little bit of double-sided tape to hold the door in place. Mm-hmm. And then I took this whole fixture and I put it up against workstation. Yeah. So I can take this stuff as you disassemble it. Got it? Gotta love that one-inch double-sided tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not too much because the clamps are gonna... Um, yeah, just a little bit. The clamps are really gonna like press this all together. And so if you use too much tape... The tape is pressure sensitive for the folks watching at home. This tape is pressure sensitive, if you didn't already know. So the harder you press on it and the longer you press on it, the harder it sticks. And so if you use too much tape here, uh, you could have a hard time getting this back apart. It's really good tape. It does release, and it would not tear the grain out, likely, but it makes me nervous when it's, like, super pressed for a long time. And this door is slightly wider than the fixture. Yes. Uh, the the anchor point is on the left-hand side of the door, so I would make sure that the left-hand side is hanging out a little bit. To get a little bit ahead of ourselves, we are going to grid off of the door itself, not off of the fixture, because we want that grid to be as accurate as possible to the door, so that the hinges go in the right place, so that it falls in the right place inside the case. Um, yes. And the fixture, or the, um, not the fixture, but the cut file has those hinges already spaced out to match the case. Put one more little Not piece quite enough. In the the other, the other interesting thing about this is that uh, the, you know, the staves kind of only touch at their center point mm -hmm. because, yeah. So think about how far that center point is away from the, from the edge. Because really, the bottom of the staves are flat until you sand the snot out of them. Um, <sighs> So they're really only touching this fixture, kind of where that arc touches the flat point at the bottom of the stave. A little better? Better. Yeah, nice. Because this fixture is so big, this might be a two-person job. Do you want I me to help feel this? It is. I put a little double-sided tape on the back here, too. Maybe oh, well. unnecessarily? I think so, if there's going to be two of us okay. holding it. the Like I said, the next fixture, the fixture that's included in the actual project, much lighter weight than this. It's slimmer. Uh, that was something that we learned in the test build. Okay. Okay. You want me to hold? You want me to clamp? Uh, good question. Slide that one in there. Yeah, okay. Maybe I clamp this side. This might be the most complex thing that we've done on this show, is putting this thing on workstation. I don't really need the uh, vertical alignment pins for this, but I have them out anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm going to move down. Eh. Yeah, I'm going to do this one. So third from the top. Okay, you feel comfortable there, Jake? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and give me some pressure. Yeah. Nice. There we go. Yeah, that's great. Beautiful. Now, one thing that I remember needing to do... Oh, dang. One thing that I remember needing to do for this was I needed an extra long probe. Mm. So let's use... Let's go ahead and use the one and a half inch O-flute and just make sure that you're really careful about hitting the edge on that. Got it. What do you think about that? I meant to get us a dowel for this. Because if you look at this fixture in workstation, um, if we switch to the workstation cam, you'll see that the the edge that we're probing, the workstation cam, if you don't mind, there we go, the edge that we're probing is three quarters of an inch down from the top of that fixture. So it's gonna be a little hard to reach with the probing bit that we typically use. We're gonna go ahead and use the engraving bit. When we get there, actually, good point, Jake, we've gotta start with a scan. Always start with a scan. Always start with a scan. And this is another reason why we're making a smaller fixture for this in the actual project is so <laughs> that you don't have to float quite so far back. 
There we go. Pop our extra long probe in. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is um, the custom anchor point on this is at the bottom left corner of your stock, which is the door in this case. And so we're gonna probe off of the two, off of two points on the front edge of the door, and then also off of the left edge of the door itself. Really important to do this off of the door and not off of the fixture. Just be really gentle with how you're contacting that edge because it is a sharp edge and if you press too hard, you'll leave a little dimple. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I would always remember, I mean, I would always trust, remember, you always trust the grid over the image. Correct. When in doubt. Yeah. Um, the image is really good for things that are in plane, but this door is well below actually the plane of that top surface of, <laughs> I'll grab these, that top surface of workstation. Um, so the image is not going to look right. The grid, always trust the grid. Should I also You use... should probably just go ahead and use that. There you yeah. go. This is our uh, longest bit we sell. Mm -hmm. It's an inch and a half long cutting, cutting height. Nice. Um, yeah, so we'll walk through this. We've got the scan, we've got the grid, we're gonna drop the design in, and then Jake, I'm gonna talk you through a couple specifics when you get to the cut settings also. Right. Cool. Z touch. Yeah, we need that file. Got that file in there? Got that file. I'll... Oh, really? Already? No, I'm working up to it. Oh, okay. Because I was going to tell you to do something else for the Z-Touch. Oh, when we got there. oh, I see you. Ah, I you, see see, you. you see where I'm going with that? I do. Yeah, okay. All right. Follow along, everybody. So this is uh, Hinge Mortis's door. Yep. And we've got that bottom left anchor point. We're going to drop that on zero, zero. And we're going to make sure that looks like it makes sense. We've got a little bit of clearance between that pocket and the hinge there, Jake. Yeah. Does that yep. look good to you? Cool, so we can go ahead and click that. And let's check both sides on that. We got a little bit of, wanna make sure we've got a little bit of clearance on both sides there. Uh, if you don't have clearance, just take a little bit of extra time and cut a bit of extra material away. Um, it is a little tricky to get those because you want, because uh, it depends on where left to right you place the door in the fixture. Right. Okay, so now I would say we're ready to cut, but this is very important because we want, um, the depth of these hinges to be relative to the edge of the door, not the top of the fixture. We need to Z-touch off of the door itself. Now to do that, I am hanging my origin off of the back edge, if you can see in that side cam. And I'm just shooting down that gap for the Z-touch. Cool. Yeah, great. All right. Now there should be encoded depths in there for you to use. There is indeed. Nice. 0.2362. So encoded depths, these are just um, like pre-coded reminders in a cut template of how deep you want to cut. Um, if you have AutoPass turned on on your machine, um, AutoPass will default to whatever encoded depth you have set for that cut. So it's going to follow around and change all the depths for us as we go. I think I'm ready to go. OK. Great, let it rip. And uh, you know, while you're doing that, I'm gonna pop a hinge out of this earlier door so that we can do a test fit. Perfect. Because I don't think this is gonna take you very long. So auto pass there. Jake's holding down auto mode with auto pass. Uh, feel confusing two autos at the same time, but that is um, 
going to both automatically step down through all those depths and offsets, and it's going to do it while automatically moving the spindle. That's what auto path or what auto mode means is the spindle is going to go ahead and keep moving as far as it can inside the confines of that corrective range until it hits the bounds of that corrective range. But since Jake's cutting these kind of small circles in the center of this sauce hinge, um, it's going to be able to move, make all that motion happen on its own. Kind of akin to Helix mode, um, similar but different. If you're curious to learn more about Helix mode, again, I would also check out that Origin Pro Tips show. I'm pretty confident we covered it in there. Man, can I just say how awesome it is not to even touch the depth button? It's pretty nice. Just have it auto-populate. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm pretty happy that uh, we didn't cut through the front of the door. One thing that I wanted to mention <laughs> was just make an extra stave or two for yourself um, and just just do a double check on this. Always do a test cut first when it's a kind of uh, it's a part that you've invested a lot of time in. I'll, I'll put it that way, um, because I've done this a bunch of times this project is designed for this flute radius and this flute depth but uh, if you if you end up using a different router bit for these flutes you might get a deeper cut and um, based on the placement of this hinge here because those flutes are kind of cutting into the hinge area uh, you don't you don't want to blow out that door I would make yeah. an I would just say make an extra stave and do a test cut before you commit to cutting the door um, the files are set up pretty specifically to trade off um, hinge clearance with flute clearance. Those are kind of the two things that are going on. Is that too tight? That is a little too tight. Let's make that a little bigger instead of wrestling with that. Yeah. yeah. And we're not really even installing this door because we have the actual finished door that has a couple more features cut into it that we'll talk to you about. Um, these are all hand-done features. And, yeah, what are we going to do? Like a negative 3 thou just to That's give five. it plenty of space? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So Jake's using offsets. He's going to go ahead and just kind of touch up the dimensions on each one of these. Now, um, we used offsets earlier, remember, for the roughing pass and the finishing pass on our template parts or on our fixture parts. Fixture, glue up fixture and uh, hinge mortising fixture. The positive offset left a little bit more material around the entire perimeter of that fixture part and then the finishing pass at a zero offset took off that extra material and left us with a perfect line on line fixture part now we have this line on line hinge mortise cut but these hinges might be a couple thousandths oversized or there's just variances in manufacturing so we are going to take off just a couple extra thousandths of an inch just uh, five thousandths of an inch on either side of this whole hinge mortise using a negative offset. Now, the easiest way to remember that, we say this a lot because we really want to drill at home, is that a positive offset always leaves more material, um, and a negative offset always removes more material. So if you're cutting on the outside of a template for, with example, with, for example, a tenon, a negative offset would take away more material and it would make that tenon smaller. If you're cutting inside a pocket, uh, like a hole or a hinge mortise, you're removing material, and so a negative offset is actually going to make that hinge mortise bigger. What do you think? Nice. In there? Feels can good. anybody see that? I don't know if we can really see that. Let's take this out of the uh, out of the fixture here. Oh, is it pretty tight? It's pretty tight. Okay. How about Let's the see. other side? This is the last one of these, so I really don't want to get it stuck. Let's give it a little more. Okay. Just a wee bit more. Just a wee bit. The last one of those hinges? Uh, yeah, in the shop. Yeah. Wow. Got to go pick up some more. Thank goodness for Thank goodness for old Center Hardware. My favorite hardware store in San Francisco. They stock sauce hinges. Um, and that's why we love using these because they're pretty easy to find. There are some things about them that I wish. Uh, were better. I wish they were adjustable. Um, in the hardware catalog, we also have Sugatsuni's brand of concealed hinges, and they actually have a line of small three-way adjustable concealed hinges. 
But these sauce ones are pretty good and they're much less expensive also. Pretty ubiquitous, really good finish quality. Come with nice steel screws. What do we think? One more try? Yeah. Hmm. I don't want to get it stuck. Let's Is there a is there an incorrect depth on that or something? Like does the does the pocket actually look right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I don't know if there's a direction to it per se. Uh there shouldn't be. Yeah. No. It sounded like you were taking off more material. This is why we do this live, everybody, because we really learn something every time. I've cut like three of these doors already. I don't want to get it stuck, so I'm going to go just a hair bigger. Um, before I do this, I want to show a quick, I guess it's like fun little hack. I don't want to auto pass this because I'm just doing a negative offset. It's really small. But to auto update this depth, I can just turn auto pass on and off. And instead of typing in 0.236, it mm -hmm. just automatically updates that depth. Here's a quick reality check before we spend a lot of time doing more offsets. Kay. Did it feel different between the last offset and this offset? Yes. Yeah, it felt looser. Okay. Then let's let's keep doing that. Maybe uh yeah, 0.013. Yeah, let's try that. And it might have something to do with this uh, this router bit because depending on the different router bits that you're using, you might have slightly different results. So when we cut this earlier, it was um, with a different long reach router bit that I like to use. It was our quarter by one inch long reach router bit, which can cut reasonably deep if you're careful with the stick out. Um, but every router bit kind of has slightly different characteristics and might require a slightly different offset. And that's why we let you play with it. Um, once you figure it out for one combination of material, template, uh, router bit, uh, once you get that offset dialed, pretty completely repeatable. Definitely sounds like we're removing more material there, just the slightest amount. There hey, we go. There we go. That feels good. And it's so nice to be able to just sneak up on that. You know? Now at least we know exactly what it wants to be for this yeah. particular hinge bit combo. Beautiful. Now, okay. We are not going to install this door. And here's why. There's a couple of things we need to do to here's it. Here's why. So um, these hinges require a pretty shallow what we call back set. The back set is the space that the hinge is set back from the edge. Um, but trade-off with this project, Phil really wanted to do these fluted doors. And to make that happen, again, without blowing out the wall of the door, we had to set that hinge back much farther than spec. Mm -hmm. And with this door, let's pull this door out, actually, so that we can look at the difference. Uh, with this door as it is right now, um, there's a lot more material around this corner. And if we installed that door in the cabinet over there, it actually wouldn't open because there's too much material back there. So <laughs> do you want a hand? No, I no, got a you foot. got it. Okay, nice. There you go. Hey, sweet. Um, what would be the best camera to show this off on? Maybe that one up there? So let's go ahead and show this chamfer off. Yeah, there we go. So you can see that 45 degree chamfer um, on that edge of the door. And here, for contrast, let's look at this, which doesn't have that chamfer. That extra material between the hinge mortise and the edge of the door is literally going to prevent the door from opening. So um, we just took that down with a hand plane here. The other thing that you're going to want to take down with a hand plane is the opposite side. Um, and what this does here is kind of allows that little door cover to conceal the little gap between the right and left door, the reveal between the right and left door. 
So that's the only other further work that we would need to do on this, but we're not gonna install that today because we're not gonna be able to open it. But should we go ahead and pop this door in the cabinet? I think so. Okay, while I'm pulling the cabinet back onto the stage, can you install this hinge back into the door? And we've got a screwdriver, we've got some screws over here. Is it sauce that comes with brass screws, but one steel screw? No, that's the Brusso stuff, uh, I think. I don't know. These, I'm pretty sure these are steel screws because they're definitely magnetic. I've never heard of magnetic brass screws. It's a new thing. Yeah. Patent pending. All right, I'm going to grab the cabinet over here. I find myself being very careful with this thing, even though it's super beefy. I can't wait to see this thing finished. Yeah. We were talking about card scraper earlier, curved card scraper for those flutes. Super important. Okay, do you want to go ahead and install that? Why not? I think this is a decent angle. Oh yeah, that door has to be open. That's not bad. Maybe, hmm, yeah, this is the best angle for this. I would just put one screw on each side. Do you want me to turn this further for you? Or can you sure. reach in there? Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody can see anyway. Yeah, Ian's suggesting we turn it towards the front, but I don't think you're gonna be able to reach in there if we turn it towards the front. We're getting heckled from the headphones here. <laughs> Say that again. Come on, Jake. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah? It's precision stuff. You got screws in there? No. There we go. Nice. This is just like any good job. One person actually doing the work and one person. Oh, you got the screws for the hinges? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's there. Yeah, nice. I think just one each would be fine. Hey. Okay. There we go. Oh. Hmm. Beautiful. I still need to put the catch in that door to keep this door closed. We're going to put a little Brusso catch in this just to keep it where it's supposed to be. But wow, holy smokes, though. It's cool. What thing. a beaut. And then it's going to hang on the wall with a French cleat, right? It's going to hang on the wall with a French cleat. So we're going to put a French cleat on the back. Yep. Excellent. Exactly. So there's a Cooper door fixture, everybody. Fluted and Coopered. Fluted and Coopered. Hope you learned something today. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in two weeks for some fine box hardware.